For a number of reasons, which I will share with you in a moment, I believe Australian Indigenous people are at the fo forefront of many of the issues at stake in the broad conference theme on rethinking cultural heritage in museums in the di digital age. I would also like to acknowledge the role played by a visionary Northeast Arnhem Land ceremonial leader and scholar who tragically passed away in August last year. In shaping my re research and its content and in developing uh, groundbreaking research in museum collections. To respect his family's wishes and to follow the ethical protocol in place in the Australian academia, I will only refer to him by his university title, Dr. Gumbula, a status that was conferred to him by the University of Sydney, who awarded him a doctorate honoris causa in 2007. Before telling you more about his life work in museums, I will briefly describe the broader institutional context and the spirit of collaboration that now broadly characterizes relationships between indigenous communities and Australian museums. Starting in the late 1970s, several international museum forums have addressed the role of museums in promoting the long-term cultural and spiritual survival of indigenous people. In 1978, the UNESCO Regional Seminar on Preserving Indigenous Cultures, a New Role for Museums, held in Adelaide in South Australia, discussed the obligations of museums to respect indigenous cultural heritage and its en enduring significance in the lives of indigenous people. In response, several countries developed policy framework reflecting the growing acceptance of indigenous rights to self-determination. In museums, this understanding resulted in the inclusion of indigenous perspectives in the management, representation, and control of the cultural heritage. In Australia, previous possessions, new obligations, policies for museums in Australia and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples launched in December 1993, the International Year for the World's Indigenous People, was developed to promote the common interests of museums and indigenous people in all aspects of museum practice where cultural heritage is concerned. It was designed to lay a policy framework which would guide the development of new partnerships between museums and indigenous people. Some of its main concerns were uh, dealing with human remains, secret sacred material, and the general collections of indigenous cultural material, and including indigenous people in research and public, um, public programs, and in the management and interpretation of the cultural material held in museum collections. A review of this policy conducted in 2000 concluded that um, this policy had substantially achieved its goals in relation to the major collecting and research museums and galleries around the country. The policy has broadly become part of the working and professional cultures of museums in Australia, but also in the last decades of libraries, art galleries and archival institutions. With the development of digital technologies in the late 1990s, new avenues for collaborations between museum and indigenous communities emerged. In the re remainder of this paper, I will examine a specific form of collaboration focused on the digital repatriation of museum collections to their source communities. While this idea seems very attractive from the outset, as it offers, for instance, an alternative to the controversial question of objects' physical repatriation, I would like to outline some of the methodological, ethical, and anthropological issues that emerge when dealing with the digital repatriation of cultural knowledge. My examples draw from fieldwork undertaken since 2003 in northeast Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory of Australia. Home to the Yolngu people, an Aboriginal group formerly known in anthropology as the Murrindjin, this tropical region offers a particularly interesting case study in that it has a long and continuous research tradition. Since Lloyd Warner's seminal fieldwork in the late 1920s, only five years after the first mission was established in what was then the Arnhem Land Aboriginal Reserve, some 40 researchers have worked in the region. In addition to a huge multimedia corpus of ethnographic records, photos, films, sound recordings, field notes, transcriptions, etc., which are disseminated throughout various institutions, <coughs> the region is also renowned for its bark paintings, thousands of which have integrated museum collections all over the world. All of these materials are, as we will see, of great value and interest um, to the Yongu. Through three examples, but there could have been many more that I could have uh, chosen from, I will show how their return in a digital format has generated new forms of reflexivity and of creativity in the ceremonial and artistic domains. 
The broader uh, conference question that I seek to address is how might the study of digital cultural practices um, enable new perspectives on collections held by ethnographic museums? So uh, you see here a map of Arnhem Land, and in red are the three main uh, Yolngu communities I'll be talking about, Milingimbi, Galawinku, and Yerkala. Um, in the first section of this paper, I will present a pioneering Yolngu digital archiving project in order to raise two significant issues for repatriate, repatriating institutions. Firstly, the complexity of digital uh, repatriation processes, which far from being a one-size-fits-all model, have to take into account local singularities, especially where religious uh, knowledge is concerned. And secondly, to insist on the significance of what, on what, of what happens outside of the archive, as the digital cultural knowledge repatriated on computers is not frozen or cut off from people's lives. So this is uh, the, the, the first example. Um, in 2003, a community organization called the Knowledge Center was established in the Yolngu Township of Galawinku on Elko Island. This initiative of a new kind was funded by the Northern Territory Libraries in a, in a bid to extend information services to remote indigenous settlements. The Knowledge Center project was um, run locally by a group of ceremonial leaders from two of the 13 clans that live in this community. And it was mainly focused on the creation of a digital archive designed to store cultural information repatriate, repatriated from various institutional and private collections. Dr. Gumbala was one of the founding directors of the Galawinku Indigenous Knowledge Center. And at the time, he was also the recipient of a research fellowship at the University of Melbourne. During his time in Melbourne, he established an innovative research partnership with Museum Victoria, an institution which holds uh, significant bark painting and photographic collections from Northeast Arnhem Land. The main objective in developing the Knowledge Centre archive was to enable local access to these museum collections in order to devise new strategies for the transmission of the associated knowledge to the younger generations who were seen to be stuck between two worlds. Ethnographic records and artworks are assimilated to consultable traces left by their forebears. Dr. Gumbala's research in museum and archival collections consisted in part in finding these traces to bring them back to the community where they could start to perform anew. Indeed, Dr. Gumbala regarded his forebears as astute negotiators who engaged knowingly in a range of relationships with outsiders, such as museum collectors. His father, Tom Jawa, for instance, a prolific painter, instigated new strategies of public representation through his participation in early anthropological studies. So um, this is a, a quote to uh, uh, illustrate what I've just been saying. These paintings are the evidence given by our ancestors. They speak of the ancestral law of the Aboriginal people of Northern Australia. We call these paintings lukuminchi, which means the foundation paintings or designs. According to Yongu customary law, luku is the footstep, the trace left by the ancestors for us to follow. Today we are still following this, uh, in these footsteps. This is how Yongu people have transferred their knowledge from generation to generation. What is important to keep in mind is that um, in the Yongu world, like it is the case in many other indigenous societies, um, Sorry, uh, it's, sorry, it's characterized by a re revelatory system of knowledge. Sacred knowledge expressed in songs, stories, paintings, or ritual objects, and by extensions in the new media representing these things, photographs, digital images, audiovisual recordings, and even some anthropological books. So all this knowledge is not free and publicly available. Sacred knowledge is part of a sacred endowment that was made by ancestral beings during a mythical past to specific clans or land-owning groups. Thus, knowledge contained in paintings and other objects, even public outside knowledge that everybody can see, is owned and controlled by specific groups. Access to knowledge is strictly restricted to certain categories of people on the basis of clan membership, kinship, gender, and ritual status. Dr. Gumbala designed a conceptual model to illustrate how the Yongu system of knowledge operates, what he called the Yongu knowledge constitution. 
This model was initially conceived as a blueprint for the Knowledge Center database to reflect differential access rights to the information repatriated from museums. So as I mentioned earlier, digital repatriation is a complex process if one is to take into account the ways in which communities wish to see this knowledge managed locally according to specific organizing principles that still very much inform the way knowledge is transmitted today in Arnhem Land. So very briefly, and, and uh, I've spoken a lot about this uh, model and, and I, we can talk for hours about this model. Um, these represent, so if you look at it, uh, vertically, these uh, represent the different ceremonial grounds where ceremonies are performed. Public ceremonies in the green, the Garma domain, this is where uh, public knowledge uh, is performed. Then the orange is semi-restricted and all the secret knowledge is in a special ground called the Ngara ground. And so this shows the differential um, access to knowledge. And then the Yolngu society is divided in two moities, Dua and Yiricha. Each moiti has got their own body of knowledge. And then the clans, every moiti has got a number of clans in them. And according to which clan you're in, which clan is your mother clan, which clan is your grandmother clan, you have differential access to their own knowledge. So this is a very brief commentary on, on uh, this very complex design, which was submitted to the computer programmers in charge of building the database. So let's now briefly consider the status of museum collections as, digi as digital records were progressively reappropriated re uh, re by the young men involved in the Knowledge Center. Dr. Gumbel's quest for his clan's object was upheld by the young epistemological principle of following in the footsteps of the ancestors. His work, as he saw it, enabled the ancestral spirits encapsulated in the paintings to be freed so as to complete a journey back to the land where they came from. He saw it as his destiny to follow the traces left by his forebears in museum collections and archives throughout the world. This was his pathway. Um, it became the Knowledge Center motto, so the, the word Wayawo, uh, which is the, the pathway. Through vision and contact with people, the museum objects could start to perform anew. They are talking to us, or we are talking now, was the response that was given to me when I inquired about the relationship people had with digital images of their objects on computer screens. So um, this is a, a quote that illustrates that. So you know that is the main focus that I'm looking at in my research today to bring that material back so it will start performing, whether it is in the object or in a photograph itself or just in a video or DVD. So bringing that material back and showing it to the people it is welcoming the older people coming back to the land, to the place where it started from, where it came from. That is very important too. It's restoring that memory again. Because we make things around us, we make them feel free, feel like they're being with us. The spiritual are be people are being with us. And we perform them and they perform us. And so this, I think it's a beautiful quote. <clears throat> so um, the spirit being Morayana uh, represented... Uh, in the bark painting here and this man performing uh, this spirit came to be a powerful embodiment of this process of repatriation. Initially found on two bark paintings in Museum Victoria, one painted by his father's father, his grandfather, and one by his father, the return as digital images of these paintings gave rise to a spectacular ceremonial initiative by the three branches of his large clan and the first participation in the Garma Festival of Traditional Culture, which is a big festival organized every year in uh, Northeast Arnhem Land. The three factions of the clan united behind the figure of Morena, a being that represent their common ancestors, both ancestral, the spirit being Morena, and historical, the grandfather, who's the, gra the common ancestor of the three branches of the clan. And um, Dr. Gumbala made this second painting to, um, on the computer to, and asked me to assemble the two paintings to represent how the structure of knowledge is completely linked to the performance of knowledge. And here you see the body painting designs of a man, a uh, ritual life cycle of a male of his own clan that correspond to the different stages of ceremony on, on the first painting. So despite the failure of the Knowledge Center project, which I don't have the time to, to explain here, this ambitious digital heritage program led to new forms of reflexivity on the status and circulation of museum objects reconceptualized as traces or ancestral footprints that could talk, 
and new modes of self-representation, as was the case with Dr. Gumbel's conceptual model, which became a very useful pedagogical tool to work with museums, curators on object classification. And so um, he, after working on the archive, he started using this. He traveled to many uh, museums in Europe. Uh, I think he even uh, came to Leiden. Um, and so this is what he says, I try to negotiate a proper awareness and to inform people about the three domains of understanding that we have in the Jung world. I had the idea to use a universal sign, the traffic light, to explain how Jung knowledge works. The green color is for the public knowledge, what we call the garma. The orange duni domain is semi-restricted knowledge, proceed with caution. And the red nara domain is for secret knowledge restricted to initiated persons. People around the world use the same traffic light sign so they can easily understand this model. So, um, in its three years of existence, the Knowledge Center also developed new collaborative research practices with a number of museums and other archival institutions. So, I can refer here to the work undertaken by Lindy Allen, who's a curator at Museum Victoria. And these projects inspired many other collaborative projects uh, in museums in Australia. The second example I wanted to share concerns um, a repatriation process I was involved in when uh, I was a postdoc at the Musique du Quai Branly a few years ago. My project consisted in redocumenting re the Carol Kupka collection of Bach paintings held in the Musée du Quai Branly from the perspective of the painter's descendants, people who now live in the community of Milingimbi. So that's one generation after. The collection was made in the late uh, 1950s. So as part of the project, I was going to leave a copy of the collection on a CD, including one for use in the community school library. Um, people I soon found out were not interested at all in discussing the subjects of the painting, so what uh, the, the traditional anthropological wor work would be, what is this painting, what's the story, what's the myth, what's the place, what's the dreaming, all these questions. What they were most interested in determining was who had inherited the rights in particular paintings and whether people still painted this story in the same way or differently. One painting posed a specific problem in that all the people I showed it to had something different to say about its status. Somebody said, no one paints like that anymore. Somebody else said, I can paint like that because that was my father's painting. Uh, and other people said, no one can paint like that because it's a restricted painting. So after having uh, followed the line of kinship, so that means talking to all these different people here who had something to say about this specific painting as sons of the painters, um, of uh, yes, different, different branches of the, the painter's clan, um, I had to take the photo of this specific painting off the CD that I was going to leave in the school library, so for public access by the non-initiated kids. But about two hours before my plane was due and I was uh, going back to France, I went to the art center in the community and I noticed the same painting at the art center stacked among other artworks produced for sale. So in the middle here you have the, the old painting from the Karel Kupka and these are uh, the two other paintings that I saw. So the painter of these uh, more recent paintings was another son of the original artist and he had actually recently painted this specific design on the chest of a young boy for initiation. So um, these uh, young boys' initiations are public ceremonies. So in Yongu terms, uh, by painting it for a public ceremony, the painting had come outside, from the inside it can, had come outside, and so now it was public. And it was agreed by all these people, so these uh, about 10 people that I saw before, I went to see them again, and everybody agreed that it was actually his prerogative as a, a painter, the eldest son of the first wife of the painter, uh, to decide um, what was the status of the painting. So this case is quite important to grasp some of the methodological challenges that can surround the repatriation of museum collections. This is a plea also for the importance of ethnographic fieldwork necessary to understand the knowledge politics at work in the source communities. For museums, this also requires to understand that the degree to which an image or ob um, object is secret or sacred may vary from community to community and also that the status may change over time, especially if religious practice still plays a role in that community's life. 
So my third and final example concerns creative uses of digital heritage in the artistic domain, and in particular the use of ethnographic records in contemporary film production. So I might have time to show you uh, then this, it's a one minute clip, so I'll just tell you a bit more about the Malka project. The Malka project is a multimedia archive and production center which was inaugurated in 2007 in Yerkala, so that's a third community of the region, on the eastern coast of the Gulf Peninsula. This initiative derives from Bukulange Mulka, which is uh, Yerkala's internationally renowned art center. Unlike the complex database architecture which had been envisaged envisioned for the Knowledge Center in Galawinku, the first example I presented, with its ambition to reflect Yolngu knowledge organization, the Malka Project's digital archive has privileged easy access and usage. Sound files are stored on conventional iTunes library and photographs uploaded on a multi-purpose digital platform generically, generically called Our Story, uh, a platform which was specifically developed for indigenous communities by the Public Libraries and Knowledge Centers branch of the Northern Territory Library. So, according to the project website, the Malka Archive currently holds some thousand images from black and white photographs taken by um, early anthropologists in the 1930s to happy snaps documenting contemporary hunting and gathering activities and local happenings. It has about 500 sound files from ethnomusicologist Richard Waterman's 1950s recordings to recent compositions by high school students, and about 47 films, including many old ethnographic documentaries. In addition to making ethnographic records and museum collections accessible on local computers, the Malka project has also developed a media production arm with a trained Yolngu film crew who has been extremely prolific in creating video content for the web. Many of these locally made short films, which uh, range from music clips to ceremonial performances, fiction, works, and animations, have been made accessible on the Malka Project YouTube channel, which I strongly encourage you to go and have a look at if, if you're interested. Together, this collection of self-authored videos reveals much about the ways in which digital media have inspired new creative practices for expressing thoughts and sentiments in the young world and beyond. <laughs> just um, finish by talking about one particular example. <laughs> so uh, this example illustrates the complementarity that exists between archiving and creative practices. It's a film called Two Brothers at Galara, which was made, to, made in 2008. And I'm not going to show the film because I, I don't have time. But you can uh, watch both a uh, short and a long version, which is 20 minutes. The storyline is articulated around three songs that were recorded in 1952 by an, the American ethnomusicologist Richard Waterman. And these songs tell about the ritual resolution of a historical conflict that opposed two brothers 20 years before the recordings occurred. What is interesting is that these songs recorded so in 1952 are performed by Binjar Puma, one of the two brothers uh, at the heart of the conflict, and his nephew Matolo, who is the narrator of the new film that was made. More than half a century later, Matolo thus offers a, a reinterpretation of this story through a film reenactment using these old songs with newly recorded songs and dances as narrative devices. The result is an original form of filmmaking featuring four generations of the Wangori clan and bringing together traditions of storytelling through a new aesthetic expression of memory and time. So, um, 
You have the old ethnographic recordings from 1952, the new recordings that are laid on top. The narrator is one of the men singing in the, in the original songs. And at the end here, um, these are the two brothers at the heart of the conflict that were photographed by the anthropologist Donald Thompson in 1942. And the photo also appears in the film. So to conclude, um, in the late 20th century in museum practice, more emphasis has been placed on indigenous knowledge and authority from source communities, showing that the meaning of collections uh, are more open. In 2005, Museums Australia produced a revised policy document uh, called Continuing Culture's Ongoing Responsibilities, which included a section on new technologies. And this section specified that Technology projects do not occur in isolation from those principles and policies, and they should be considered and applied as appropriate to ensure that digitization projects meet appropriate levels of practice. Such strategies should be living agreements, and I, and I stress this, living agreements regularly review to ensure their relevance in light of changing law and law. Through the presentation of young creative engagements with digital technologies, especially around the processes of digital repatriation of museum and archival collections, um, I have sought to reflect on ways in which these recent cultural practices challenge common perception of what heritage is as a patrimonial objectivation of the past. These dynamic relationships to the past enable new perspectives on the value of new collections as living heritage that is open to continuous reinterpretations.